Um, I have to, however, take issue with a few points that were raised as well as go into my formal presentation about the uh, UN and the Arab-Israel conflict. Let me set the record straight on one point. No one in Israel argues that Israel is not committed to implementing agreements that the previous government of Israel has signed. Whatever was signed by the previous government of Israel will be implemented by the current government of Israel. There shouldn't be any ambiguity about that. In fact, if we have a problem today in the Oslo process with our Palestinian neighbors, it's a very simple problem. At the end of the Hebron negotiations, we sat together with the Palestinians and we put together a joint work plan issues that were extremely important to the Palestinians, issues that were extremely important for Israel. We identified what these issues were in this joint work plan. We wrote them down on a piece of paper. At the time, the American peace coordinator, Ambassador Dennis Ross, saw the two lists that the Israelis and the Palestinians developed on one piece of paper. He read these two lists before Chairman Arafat and Prime Minister Netanyahu. And when both men said, yes, they will implement these two lists on the basis of reciprocity, Dennis Ross took out his pen and signed this agreement. It was called the Note for the Record. It was an appendix to the Hebron Protocol. Now, I know there are those who assert that Israel doesn't keep its commitments. But if you just take out a pen from your pocket and go through this list, the list of what are Palestinian responsibilities and Israeli responsibilities, you will find something surprising because it defies the conventional wisdom. Israel fulfilled every single commitment in the note for the record that it committed itself to in January 1997 in the Oslo process. And sadly, I don't say this with, with great glee, I say this with sadness, the Palestinian Authority did not fulfill a single commitment. That is the reality we are dealing with. And therefore, when we speak about implementation of things that have been signed, whether by the past government, previous government of Israel or the current government of Israel, we are willing to go ahead and implement. And I just want to make that point very clear. Now, let me start with something which Ambassador El Arabi did not raise. But it's an accusation, it's something which is hovering out there in the aftermath of the current chapter of the Iraq crisis. There is a notion that's put out there many times. Look, look at UN resolutions on Iraq. The whole world is mobilized to making sure they're implemented. There are Western powers talking about the use of military force. But what about the resolutions on Israel and the Arab states? Nobody seems to be very agitated about the fact that these aren't implemented. And therefore, an assertion has been made out there that there's a double standard in the UN system, or that other states that have different policies towards Iraq and towards Israel also have a double standard. Let me begin by stating that I reject out of hand this notion of a double standard. I'll get into the UN Charter elements in a moment. But I reject the notion because I think it is important for all of us, Israelis and Arabs, to recognize that Iraq is a unique case. We are speaking about a rogue state that has used, I repeat, has used weapons of mass destruction, both in combat against the Iranian army, and secondly, against innocent Iraqi civilians, particularly Iraqi Kurds in Kurdistan. And those of you who might have watched 60 Minutes last night and saw a revisit to the town of Khalapja that was struck by Iraqi chemical weapons in 1988 can see not only the damage that was done in 1988, but the genetic damage done to the Kurdish population of Khalapja. To draw a comparison between a country which has used chemical weapons repeatedly against its neighbors and against its own citizens, to draw a comparison between a country which has invaded its neighbors. It initiated the Iran-Iraq War in 1980, 
and attacked Kuwait in 1990, in August 1990. To draw an analogy between that and any other country in the Middle East is unacceptable. And I, as an Israeli, reject it, reject the analogy to Israel. But so does the UN system. And here, normally Israelis stand up and criticize the UN. Here is something which I will commend. The UN recognized that fact. And for that reason, the resolutions with reference to Iraq, going back to the time of the invasion, up until the present discussions, I haven't seen the last draft resolution for the Security Council uh, that's presently being worked on, but they make reference, specific reference, to Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, which deals with cases of aggression. In contrast, the resolutions with reference to Israel and the Arab states were promulgated under Chapter 6 of the Charter, which doesn't deal with aggression, it deals with peaceful resolution of disputes. Now, the distinction is very important because resolutions dealing with aggression under Chapter 7 are self-enforcing. The UN itself enforces those resolutions. Resolutions under Chapter 6, what do they require? It requires the parties to sit down and negotiate, guided by the spirit, for example, of Resolution 242 and 338, or Resolution 425 with regards to Lebanon. But while, and this is the point I want to emphasize, while the resolutions on Iraq be basically imposed by the United Nations, the resolutions with respect to Israel and the Arab states require two to tango. They require both parties to sit down. You can't wave a magic wand and say, we want 242 implemented, so just do it. It doesn't happen that way. We have to sit down with the Palestinians, we have to sit down with the Syrians to make sure that the concepts raised in 242 are dealt with by the negotiating parties. And so they are very different even under the UN system. And I also want to take the opportunity to credit the Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan. Because Kofi Annan appeared in Tehran in December 1997. And even then, in December 1997, this accusation was hovering in the air. And Kofi Annan, standing in Tehran, stated that the resolutions with respect to Israel and the Arab states were not self-enforcing, whereas, of course, the resolutions with respect to Iraq are self-enforcing. So this distinction is recognized in the UN system. Now, now that we've distinguished between two different cases, the unique case of Iraq, which shouldn't be compared to anybody, and the Arab-Israeli cases, let us see how the UN has been dealing with the guidance that it has set up for uh, the resolution of the Arab-Israel conflict. Here we do have some serious problems with how the UN has been operating. And it isn't a critique of the UN Secretariat, it's not a critique of the UN Secretary General, it is a structural problem. It is a result of voting patterns that have developed over the years in the United Nations. We've developed a situation where Israel is constantly accused of various things, where far more serious issues have arisen in the international system which are completely ignored or not dealt with by UN resolutions. To give you an example, we had, of course, the recent cases over the last year of Israeli construction in Jerusalem in an area called Har Choma. Now, this generated, for example, in the UN system, the convening of emergency special sessions. Now, as some of you might know, emergency special sessions of the General Assembly were originally conceived back in the early 1950s when the Security Council was stalemated and North Korea had invaded South Korea. So emergency special sessions were supposed to deal with real emergencies to international peace, but we find condominium construction in Jerusalem, which I will admit may be controversial, although I can say it's consistent with the Oslo Accords and prove it. Nonetheless, we find this is the subject for emergency special sessions of the UN, and not many of the other uh, cases that have, of international threats to international peace that occur. To take another example, this series of emergency special sessions has been trying to advance the notion that the high contracting parties of the Fourth Geneva Convention, 
which was signed in 1949. The high contracting parties should meet and discuss the application of the Fourth Geneva Convention to the territories, to the West Bank, Gaza, West Bank and Gaza, for example. I won't go into the, all the legal arguments of why Israel says de jure it doesn't apply, but de facto keeps the, the, its commitments to these conventions. But if you think about it with some kind of international perspective, you wonder, you ask, have the high contracting parties of the 1949 Fourth Geneva Convention been convened in any other case since 1949? The answer is no. What about when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan? Weren't convened. What about when they invaded Czechoslovakia? Weren't convened. What about when Iraq invaded Kuwait? Weren't convened. So the status of Israel in the West Bank, which was as a result of a defensive war, that is a subject for the meeting of the high contracting parties of the Fourth Geneva Convention, whereas all the other cases of the movement of forces are not even raised. This, these kinds of inconsistencies or problems erode the credibility of the UN system and, of course, create a problem for us. Now, I am actually more optimistic today than pessimistic about the future of the UN. Because I believe the international system is beginning to change. The UN system is beginning to change. It's beginning to recognize that these distortions don't serve anyone's interest. And there is a kind of exhaustion with these automatic resolutions that have come up every year, and you find it with many delegates. But I think there's another reason that may be affecting the future of UN voting patterns. Many of these voting patterns were established back in the 1950s when the UN was, ex was involved in a worldwide campaign against decolonization. And the struggle of the Palestinians, as it emerged in the 60s and early 70s, came into this context of decolonization. Even though we are not the French Empire, the British Empire, we have no comparison, there's no basis of comparison, nonetheless, it was useful for advancing, it was a comparison that was useful for advancing the Palestinian cause in the UN. Today, in the international community, we are beyond that central preoccupation with decolonization that existed among African and Asian countries back in the 50s and 60s, and even into the 70s. We are now in an era in which more and more countries in the international system are concerned with global Lebanonization. That is the breakup of countries according to ethnic, religious, linguistic lines. And the threat that almost any movement that emerges in a Yugoslavia type of scenario can seek, for example, membership in the UN, which gives many countries pause before they will support the PLO becoming a full non-voting member of the UN. Or another concern, these various attempts to achieve um, greater representation or to, to break up currently existing countries along tribal, religious, or, or linguistic lines also served and affected the discussion this last fall in the United Nations over the attempt to say that Israel's credentials should apply to certain parts under its control up to the green line and not beyond the green line. Because this same argumentation could be used among the hundred ethnic and territorial conflicts that exist in the world today. So in my judgment, there has been a sobering, it's slow, it's steady, of many countries that are in the UN today, so that what have been the automatic majorities that have supported UN General Assembly resolutions many times against Israel may not always be there in the future. I'm confident with determination, with explaining our view, we can, um, we can persevere and we can come across and um, change many of the views that have been represented. I will close again with my opening remarks. Israel is determined to implement the agreements which it has signed. And Israel is determined to make the peace process work. The key to making the peace process work, and this goes back to chapter six, is allowing the parties to sit down and resolve their differences bilaterally. Anyone who believes that a peace solution can be imposed is wrong. Anyone who believes that an ultimatum given to any country in the world under this chapter six mechanisms and thinking that will somehow work and resolve a negotiation is wrong. 
the best way to make the peace process work, even though we're dealing with much more difficult issues than we were two or three years ago, is to have, make sure that the parties sit down and work out the issues among themselves. Israel's movement in 1967 into its neighbors did not come as a uh, flash in the middle of the night, but came for circumstances which I'm not going to go into on the front with Egypt. We're now in a state of peace. But anybody who knows a little bit of history and has read any introductory book to the 67 war knows the sequence of events that occurred during the month of May. But we also face not only the massing of the Egyptian army on our southern border, we faced the, faced the entire Jordanian army in the West Bank, which was about to be reinforced by one-third of the Iraqi army that had crossed Jordan and was about to cross the Jordan River when the war began. Plus, we had the whole Syrian army massed in the Golan Heights. So to even compare a situation where Israel was completely encircled by massing armor to a situation where Iraq, was Iraq threatened by Kuwaiti armor? Was Iraq threatened by the massing Kuwaiti army about to inflict an enormous strike onto Iraq? There's no basis. So I think we should completely disentangle these issues and not try and say, well, Israel went into its neighbors. It went to its neighbors and they're completely different circumstances that we have to remember. The last thing since the issue of settlement activity came up, I understand this is a point of controversy. It's a point of controversy between Israel and many friendly Western countries. But one fact has to be underlined for speaking about who's consistent with the Oslo Accords. We received, when, we, when the current government came into power, inherited some um, important memoranda that were prepared by the previous government including a memoranda from March 18, 1996, written by the then the legal advisor of the Foreign Ministry, who argued that Mr. Arafat attempted to put a settlement freeze into the Oslo Accords, Oslo I and Oslo II. He attempted. Mr. Rabin, our late Prime Minister, and Mr. Paris, our Foreign Minister at the time, rightfully rejected a settlement freeze during the interim period. Why? This is a final status issue. During the interim period, the Palestinians will build, Israelis will build. So just make it a discussion for final status. But in the interim period, let people live. And despite the fact that the Palestinian attempt to put a f settlement freeze into Oslo failed, Mr. Arafat, first it was Abu Mazen who came and signed the Oslo I accord here in Washington. Mr. Arafat came and signed the Oslo II interim agreement here in Washington as well. So they signed the agreement even though it didn't have a settlement freeze. And as a result, our late Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin stood before the Knesset just before Oslo II was about to be ratified by the Knesset on October 5, 1995. And he made the following comment, statement to the Knesset. He said, we made a commitment to the Knesset not to uproot any settlement in the framework of the interim agreement, nor to freeze construction and natural growth. After he made that statement and completed the uh, speech, the Knesset voted 61 in favor out of 120 to support the Oslo II interim agreement. That's the way Israel understood, that's the way the previous government understood the Oslo agreement. And that is why we allow for natural growth of settlements, despite the uh, sentiments that are sometimes expressed in the United Nations. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to. Uh open up this discussion to, uh, to members of the audience. There's a, a, a number of you that want to ask questions. If I could just ask that when you um, are called upon to ask questions, please wait for um, uh, someone to come to you with a microphone, because we've uh, plugged the microphones directly into the audio and that people can hear this from coast to coast. If I can ask the two gentlemen uh, a question about one UN resolution that has been receiving a lot of press and indeed a lot of good press in recent weeks, um, UN Resolution 425 regarding Lebanon. Uh, for many years, this is a resolution that Israel opposed in terms of implementing uh, regarding uh, uh, South Lebanon. Um, over the last two months, Israeli leaders, including the defense minister in just this week, the Israeli prime minister, have uh, reinterpreted their views regarding 425 and now want to see it implemented forthwith. Could I ask? Um, your views on Resolution 425. What does it require in terms of uh, the Lebanese government's responsibility for uh, security up to the international border? And what does it require in terms of Israeli withdrawal and Israeli expectations of Lebanese security? Gentlemen? Uh, 
don't like to read documents, but um, sometimes you have to. I sent a letter to the Secretary General on the 27th of January, 1998, which related to this issue of Resolution 425, so I suggest that I simply read to you the relevant paragraph. I would like to clarify Israel's position with regard to Security Council Resolution 425. As clearly stated by Israel's Minister of Defense, that's Yitzhak Mordechai, in a recent interview for the magazine El Watan al Arabi, Israel is ready to implement the provisions of the resolution. However, Resolution 425 does not call for an unconditional withdrawal. Israel is prepared to implement the withdrawal envisaged in the resolution, but only within a framework that will ensure the implementation of all elements of the resolution, including implementation of UNIFIL's expressly stated goals of the, quote, restoring of international peace and security, unquote, and, quote, assisting the government of Lebanon in ensuring the return of its effective authority in the area, unquote. Such effective authority would obviously have to include, among other things, arrangements for the protection of all residents of the area. So to make a long story short, we do not see Resolution 425 as something that you just get up and leave as a unilateral withdrawal, but we see it in the context of the other elements that are related to in 425, which include restoring international peace and security and the return of the effective authority of Lebanon in the area. On the double standard, I'm just going to emphasize one point again. I don't think it serves the interests of, I think, the Arab side to talk about the double standard. You don't want to put, you, I think it's extremely important for the Arab world itself to hold out Iraq as a unique case. Now, I understand that there are sentiments and there are people and there are editorial writers who write what they want. but. There is a very strong case that should be made by all of us to identify this unique case of aggression. If we're to build a new region, and I believe we can build a new region, and we can talk in terms of language of vision as we obtain security and peace agreements with our neighbors. But I believe that in order for us to get there, we have to identify this unique case and not ever mix Iraq with any other case in the region. If Israelis and Arabs can stand together and identify a unique case of aggression and recall to the world that it is a unique case, I think we have a better chance of building a safer region. But if we begin to respond to this reality in the UN or in the international system with kind of tribal instincts, in which we gather around the different sides according to our, um, our ethnic orientation, I think our chances of, clear, of creating clear standards for the future will be very much compromised. And it's very simple in terms of the implementation of UN resolutions with regard to Israel. If anybody wants them implemented, the best thing to do is tell our Arab neighbors to sit down with us and negotiate. It's that simple. If you want it implemented, we'll sit down and negotiate how we go about achieving, for example, secure and recognized borders, which is an element in 242. Now, with regard to Lebanonization, there is a problem emerging across the international system. And you don't have to have you know, an advanced degree in international relations to understand that, which is much of the order that was existed during the Cold War has broken down. And that um, uh, was the positive side of the Cold War. The order has broken down. And that we are now seeing an outburst of ethnic uh, sectarian conflicts that are armed across the international system. Now, we are prepared, and we are in the middle of a process with the Palestinians to negotiate a permanent status outcome. We have our own vision of what that outcome should look like. But if the Palestinians, through the PLO, seek to establish, prior to these negotiations, a status at the UN that resembles a state, this is something which many other countries that have 
other types of conflicts, ethnic conflicts, linguistic conflicts, the types that I've raised, see whether the analogy is perfect or imperfect as a point of concern for them as well. But the other example that I raised that I think is also important to keep in mind is the notion that Israel's credentials end at the green line. This is something that I found many countries, which are not friendly with Israel, even countries that don't have diplomatic relations with Israel, were concerned that credentials could be used as an instrument for resolving territorial conflicts. And because you have now this surge of ethnic and territorial conflicts around the world, many countries are very concerned that that example, that precedent established by the Palestinians, had they gone ahead with this initiative, would have boomeranged against them. So what I'm saying is that the international setting has changed. The international setting where the paramount concern was decolonization, which was the convenient context for advancing Palestinian claims, is different. Now we have a different context. What will be the final status outcome of the negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians? We have to sit down and negotiate that separately. What I'm saying is that the context, the international context, is evolving and changing. Let me surprise you. I understand the perspectives of both sides on this um, issues of settlement activity and further redeployment. I understand the concerns of the Palestinians. Of course, I understand our concerns. But one of the reasons why Prime Minister Netanyahu has proposed putting the center of gravity of our efforts in permanent status negotiations is precisely because of these kinds of disagreements. Look, the Oslo Accords are crystal clear. The Palestinians can build in their towns and villages, and they are building, and Israel can build in its settlements. That is crystal clear in the Oslo Accords. Palestinians feel otherwise. They refer to language that the Ambassador al Arabi referred to about not predetermining how to establish the language. Yes. Preempting. Not preempting the final outcome. Preempting the final outcome. Not taking any measures which will preempt the final outcome. Something along those lines. Anyway. So uh, from our viewpoint, because the specific language on settlement activity wasn't put into the agreement, this doesn't mean settlement activity. This means the Palestinians can't declare a state, because that would change the status of the West Bank, and we can't annex chunks of the West Bank, because that would change the status of the West Bank. That's what that clause means. Neither side shall initiate or take any step that will change the status of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip pending the outcome of permanent status negotiations. If the Palestinians pour concrete to build to Palestinian towns and villages, or we pour concrete, to, chair, to build uh, Israeli settlement activity, to uh, uh, have natural growth of settlements. Neither of those things change the, the status of the West Bank from our, our point of view. But because of these different viewpoints, the best thing for us to do, look, the interim agreement, we are obligated to implement. But you only learn when you actually do an agreement what are the weak points and what are the strong points. And what happened in the interim process is very clear. The, the trust of the parties was eroded because they could interpret these things differently, which is why we should put the center of gravity of our efforts in accelerating a permanent status negotiation. And that's the heart of the Prime Minister's proposal, Prime Minister Netanyahu's proposal. And by the way, the U.S. government has been very sympathetic with that viewpoint because we could argue from now ad infinitum about further redeployments and settlements and, and Palestinian villages and towns. The best thing for us to do is put our efforts on permanent status. And I think if we do that, I think it would help the Palestinian Authority with uh, Mr. Arafat's own constituency. Because Palestinians would see the light at the end of the tunnel. This thing is actually going to lead to a final status outcome. They're sitting and talking about the issues that are of greatest importance to the Palestinians. But the more we belabor these issues, which are not well defined, which there's disagreements about how to uh, interpret them, although we feel very firmly about our interpretation. We feel it's something that's absolutely clear. I think the more we get belabored by the in, in the interim period, we have a confidence eroding process rather than a confidence building process. I think we get into the structural elements of how the UN operates. Israel is not part 
of a regional grouping. This is an old complaint of ours because we can't get nominated to uh, the Security Council. We can't become candidates to the Security Council and many other UN bodies. But it's more than just a formal argument. It's a fundamental reality of Israel being a people who are, in a certain sense, structurally isolated in the world. We are not part of the European Union having the whole power of the European Union standing behind you, or part of the Arab League where you have an Arab body which advances Arab interests together. And then once you have these bodies, for example, let's say resolutions on Israel, the usual process is uh, Mr. El Kidwe, the Palestinian observer, will consult with his Arab colleagues. They will take some draft resolution. They will then move from the Arab consulting framework to the non-aligned movement or the Group of 77. And these structural uh, elements provide automatically within the General Assembly well over 100 out of the 185 members supporting these uh, various resolutions. We don't have some kind of league of states that we associate with which will automatically advance pro-Israel resolutions in the United Nations. So that's a fundamental problem. Plus, we have a fundamental position. Let's say we could. Let's say there was a potential group of states that would advance pro-Israel resolutions in the UN. Let's say we would, such a thing existed. We fundamentally believe, consistent with Chapter 6 of the Charter, that the best way for us to resolve our differences with our neighbors is through bilateral direct negotiations and not through the UN uh, framework. Even when I send a letter, I'll share with you something. When I send a letter to Secretary General Kofi Annan, which gets circulated as a UN document, one of the debates we always have, do we want to use the UN as a mechanism for putting our points across? So you know, that's something which we sometimes consider. So we are not fundamentally interested. We're fundamentally interested in resolving our differences on Lebanon with the Lebanese, with, on uh, the issues with the Palestinians, with the Palestinians, with Syria, bilaterally, not using the multilateral framework. But there is a structural problem, which is why we are always a, a voice that is alone. And we don't have the automatic support of large block voting. I uh, simply we are not in the business of having live maneuvers on Lebanese territory and that kind of and that, that kind of description. We are facing a reality that I think the world has to know about, and we just gotta better also set the record straight. We are facing a reality where Iranian aircraft carrying large cargoes are landing at Damascus International Airport, unloading shoulder-fired missiles, Katusha rockets, all kinds of implements of war. They're transshipped from Damascus to the Bika, and they're fired, they're used, transferred to Hezbollah, fired on Israeli soldiers, fired on Lebanese civilians, and fired into the Galilee. This is a fundamental problem in Lebanon that we want to solve, and that is, you know, Resolution 425 just doesn't relate to uh, Israel's position in the southern uh, security zone. It relates to this fundamental reality that no nation could live with.